is now the time to buy Stefan Diggs. That and more this week on the couch. Paul Chargian, we've been patient, is now the time to buy Stefan Diggs. No. I think be glad that you didn't invest, Sig. This team is what it is for the Vikings. Um, they're going to have a handful of good games when they play teams that simply can't get to the quarterback. But what we've we've firmly established at this point is Kirk can't be trusted. This is a run-first offense, and Diggs is going to be a highly inconsistent per, uh, fantasy performer. And I think what you've seen through five weeks is pretty much what he is. And he's going to be a flex-level starter for the rest of the year who's second in line behind Adam Thielen to get fed in most weeks, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and and I should mention as well, Sig, there is a non-zero chance that something goes horribly wrong with Diggs. It you know he leaves the team, the team yeah. leaves him. You know there's there's a there's a there's a potential that something goes horribly wrong, and he doesn't even give you any points in many weeks. Right, and so what's the real story here? I mean, are, are the Vikings going to? reassert their authority and say we're you're not going to tell us whether to trade you or not and regardless they're going to hold him through this or can he i mean it's funny we were alluding to nba happenings before we came on the air but you know there's this there's this you got your nba in my nfl about (laughs) player (laughs) autonomy right player autonomy players being able to decide their destiny um and mike zimmer is i mean there's layers to here with Zimmer. Like, is Zimmer even going to be around next year? So if we talk about the digs and the long-term plan for the Vikings, uh, there's a lot there, Paul. G- give us your take on it. Well, first, um, understand that m- everything I understand about the Diggs situation is that his frustration is centered entirely on Kirk Cousins. He earnestly <laughs> believes that Kirk <laughs> is not the future for this team, that he's right. not requisite of being the quarterback for the Vikings, and his frustration is really centered on him. So that's you know. So know that now. What is that? Also know that the team has no intention of of, of moving Diggs. I've I've been told that repeatedly yeah. that it would take a monster deal uh, for them to move Diggs, and they view Diggs as a long term guy. His contract's incredibly team f- uh, favorable going forward, mm-hmm. and it, it they are, do not intend to move him now. If it turns out Kirk Cousins doesn't get materially better over the course of this year. Even with the third year and the $32 million he would be paid in 2020, this team probably does not go forward with Kirk. And presumably, they've told Diggs, listen, one way or another, this thing's going to get better for you. It is either going to get better by Kirk either not being here, not starting, or Kirk just gets better and you get better with him. So um, they've already dropped the hammer on him with a $200,000 fine for missed meeting and a missed practice, which is a lot of money. And the, the, the hope is that, that that will send, that has sent the message to him that he needs to, he needs to fall in line with the team and at least suck it up through the rest of this year. And they didn't go after the guaranteed money, although they could have. They could uh, have. Yes. Right. So, yes. and it almost sounds like from what you're describing, Paul. And it's funny when we were corresponding about the show, you said oh, it was a boring waiver wire. And really, it we, is. We, we've reached cruising altitude in the fantasy season, the NFL season, where the real NFL, I think, way overshadows fantasy right now at this moment in terms of things that are fascinating, but they all overlap. But just to go down this, you know, to tap this vein and go into this a little deeper, it almost sounds like because, hey, if the Vikings don't at least win a playoff game this year, I mean, it, it's going to feel like this, where's this era going? Where's the Zimmer era going? But it almost sounds like you're saying Cousins will be the first one to go and Zimmer and Spielman will get another year. And then who knows, Nick Foles is the quarterback? I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah. there's something like that. Is that the scenario you're envisioning if the Vikings go nine and seven? Because they're in the toughest division in football. They are uh, NFC West in that conversation too, I think. But yeah, that's it's it's a very tough division, and if they don't make the playoffs, I think the end is here for Zimmer and quite possibly the general manager Rick Spielman. Um, and Spielman's hit on a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, if you can't get quarterback right, right. in the NFL, that's it. You know, it's it's kind of over for everybody, including the coach. And um, you know they rolled the dice on Kirk, and to this point, it's been uh, it's been a failure. And it's you're right. So so change change is afoot if things don't yeah. uh, if the Vikings don't get to the playoffs and probably make uh, make a little bit of noise in the playoffs. 
changes afoot you know, everywhere around the league, always, which is fun. fun. Is I, would, I was just reading about the, uh, my Pittsburgh Steelers' newest quarterback, Duck Hodges. Uh, but <laughs> um, th- 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 there can be fairy tales. I mean, I think sometimes, Paul, fantasy and our immersion in fantasy um, underwhelms, makes us underwhelmed when these unbelievable real football stories unfold before our eyes, like Gardner Minshew and the, and the Jacks. I mean, this is this is unthinkable. And then there's two stories intersected here because after we won or two, the troll job was, you know, uh, Mayfield could be Minshew could be Mayfield. No, you know, Mayfield could become Minshew. And the reality now is that's kind of conventional wisdom. And some of it is the blood is on Cleveland staff. And I remember hearing something. And by the way, on the cousins thing real quick, I was just remembering how when Alex Smith showed up in Washington, I can't remember who it was now that said like, now we have a real leadership, a real quarterback. It yeah. makes me think about that. It's not just necessarily on the field stuff, maybe uh, that's going on with this pleasure with cousins. Well, and, and, and to that point with Kirk, yeah. you know, he's, he, he's a good guy, right? You know, he's a nice guy. He's the kind of guy that we would probably be friends with outside of the world of football if he were not mm-hmm. a football player or whatever. And, um, but leader of men, just not there. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of that is set when the stage is the biggest and the stakes are the highest and the chips are down. You really want that quarterback that steps up in that moment and carries your team, even if it's just, you know, getting that that first down that you have to have or whatever. And right, just doesn't seem to have that in the fiber of his being, Sig. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's and that's where they they are. Um, but you know, looking at where Jacksonville is right now is really exciting. And of course, mm-hmm. um, I think it's funny, Paul, because when I think of Minshew, I can't help but think of Mike Leach. And I saw it was um, Trevor Sikema from the Draft Network had an article about potential college coaches becoming pro coaches, and that Mike Leach said he he would be interested or he'd listen if the NFL mm-hmm. called. I really of want course. Mike Leach. I really want Mike Leach in the NFL. I mean, yeah. I, I don't even know how it's going to go, good, bad, ugly. I just think it'll be entertaining. But I th- but Minshew, because Mike Leach was one of the people saying, I don't understand what the NFL is missing here about Gardner Minshew. And he was an Alabama commit. I mean, he's it's not like yeah. that sho- not yeah. that shocking. Um, but what has happened here, Paul, is, I mean, even your most, uh, brought Nick Foles already, even your most optimistic expectations for Nick Foles, you wouldn't have had Leonard Fournette or DJ Chark. Maybe the most shocking transformation from year one to year two for of a player that I can remember. Um, and even D.D. Westbrook now, especially it's going to be interesting this week as the Jags play the Saints and you'll mm-hmm. probably see Lattimore on Shark. That's going to be fun to watch. Um, yeah. are, are people still underestimating what the Jags are worth in fantasy leagues? I mean, is it still a time to buy? Buy high on your Jags? Well, Gardner Minshew is still largely unowned. Uh, despite the fact that he clocks in at what about uh, would you say quarterback 11. 15 11 yeah okay, no, there I think he's in the top 12 yeah I just pulled up his uh, I'm pulling up his ownership right now he is 19 percent owned in ESPN so yeah that's you know that certainly suggests that that people are still they're still not buying into it and let's remember by the way Minshew's got some got some run to his mm-hmm. game and there's an opportunity for that this week potentially um he's turned into a guy that that fantasy owners and myself, I have to account for what he might do every week, right. and in a way that you know, the, at bottom tier quarterbacks, I'm not grinding on on Luke Falk and <laughs> trying to you know figure out what his odds are, you know what what he might be able to do. He this is Gardner Minshew's turned into a guy that I need to grind on, and I got to make sure that I account for. It. And I I love that about I love that about a game. The kid's just good, and it's not just moxie and intangibles. It's the tangible stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the, you know, it's the completed pass with guys, uh, you know, attacking him in the pocket. It's the mobility. It's the throwing on the run and the accuracy. He's got all these things. And we see a lot of rookie quarterbacks that once they put together a body of work of a couple of couple of game tapes, three game tapes, defenses start picking that guy apart. We haven't seen that yet no. in, at all. Um, and flip wasn't the problem last year. How about that? Flip wasn't the problem last year. No, because no. this team has set him up for success. And this team yeah. has, has had the right mix of, of structure and allowing him to flourish. But what's really fun about this, is this all circles back to draft and quarterback evaluation, Paul, is I still think primarily quarterback is an emotional, spiritual, psychological position. And mm. secondarily is a physical position. And he just doesn't. He, it looks like he's been his his whole life just practicing for these moments. He's not not even not only is he not overwhelmed. If anything, when things go wrong, like against 
Carolina last week, when things will go wrong, it's because he's too cool because he's too like att- in attack mode and not just aggressively attacking, but just rising to the occasion for the, the job that he he's been given and, and, and it's been foisted upon him. But, you know, it's like DJ Chark. So let's use again, the make Mayfield, the Mayfield ministry thing is going to be fun because really yeah. and truly, if you watch the way Minshew play, it's how people are saying Mayfield's going to do stuff like that. And Minshew's the one doing it and Mayfield's regressing. And there's a whole thing, and there's been some good discussion by Matt Walden and others about year two is really when you start to evaluate a quarterback that you know that side. But from a fantasy standpoint, also a vector standpoint, you know, we just watched Cleveland get embarrassed, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like it leaves that taste in your mouth, right? So um, Baker Mayfield, ahead. as a side note, yeah, he's got he's got four touchdowns. Sig, that's yeah. the lowest number of any quarterback to have played each of their teams' games. Right. Baker Mayfield, right. you know, I think virtually everybody had him as a top five ish quarterback going into the season. And you look at, you know, all the different weapons that were surrounding him and you felt like the thing couldn't go wrong and it's gone wrong on a scale that none of us really expected right now to the point that I, I think most people have already found already found another solution yeah. to work around Baker Mayfield. And you're not waiting for Baker Mayfield really. No. Um, because, uh, you know, Okay, there's Seattle this week. That's fine. And then a bye. And then you got New England, Denver, and Buffalo on the other side of the bye. So why not drop him now? Yeah. You know, we've got a term that we use called the sabotage drop. Right. The sabotage drop is when you drop a big name player in the hopes that somebody else will use up their uh, their waiver equity, either a mm-hmm. high claim or a bunch of fab money to go get that guy. And then they'll compound the blunder by then starting this shiny right. new thing that just fell in their lap. Baker Mayfield falls into that category. This is a non-trivial game against Seattle, bye week, and then Patriots. You're not going to start him for three weeks, so is he worth the roster spot? And can you damage another opponent potentially by somebody that has to uh, give something to get him? Sabotage drop Baker Mayfield. And what's interesting about this is that then after that New England Denver Buffalo stretch, which is pretty brutal, Mm -hmm. then it's then it's well actually I have to get my neurotic Steelers blinders off (laughs) and say the Steelers defense actually has has been somewhat stifling. Um, So the two matchups with the Steelers bookending a Miami game, and then in the fantasy playoffs you get Cincinnati, Arizona, and Baltimore. Unfortunately, the other Cincinnati matchup is Week 17. The uh, uh, NFC South best division of football, AFC. I'm I'm sorry, NFC North best division of football, AFC North worst division of football probably doesn't even deserve to send a team to the playoffs. So by the time the sabotage drop has done its sabotage, then maybe you get some rebound. But this all revolves around um, Odell Beckham. Right. Um, And and there's there's some good questions in the chat room right now. You know, look at this fun stuff I can do now, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Isn't this great? Yeah. Answer live. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. You can click on one of these and put it up. Oh yeah. If you, if you sell on OBJ, so Brad can't, so Rob Monticelli says buy, sell or hold OBJ. Brad Cannon says, if you sell OBJ now, you're getting 25 cents on the dollar. Who's going to want to buy him? This is a good point. Um, And he brings up, you know, Todd Munkin, uh, maybe if Munkin gets, I mean, because we saw what Munkin did to Tampa last Mm -hmm. year, target share air yards. And you saw in that money night game, even though it went terribly, um, you saw that, and so here's a, a good data point to start out with. Zanker says he got OBJ for Gallup, good or bad. I love Gallup. I love the way he's playing. I wouldn't be surprised if Dallas has some more games that are favorable for Gallup's outlook, but I would do that. You know, if I could mm-hmm. get Beckham for Gallup right now, I probably wouldn't hesitate. What would you say about that data point as we jump into the Odell Beckham discussion? I love Gallup, but that, you know, maybe this isn't really so much about Gallup, but more about Beckham. On the whole, We've seen this with Odell Beckham before. There in, right. in seasons past, there he has these dips in productivity that makes everybody question the real value that Odell has. But in almost every case in time, he gets proven out to make good on most of the original projection for him. And you know, I was a guy at one point in the preseason. I remember you and I talking yeah. in maybe early August. I had Odell Beckham number one on sure. my list. And you know, over the course of the preseason, I think I lowered him down to like five. Um, if I can get him really is, if it really is going to be pennies on the dollar, quarters on the dollar, um, I love getting really good players. And Odell Beckham is a really good player yeah. on the cheap. Um, but the, you know, as, as you mentioned, the schedule here is not working in his favor. And so the, I, it, I, 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 I like the idea of getting him. I'd be nervous about over, about paying. But if I'm really going to pay half price, I'm interested. Well, and Gal, I mean, by putting Gallup there as a data point, I'd say any receiver yeah. – where like the top 10 is not in his range of outcomes, I would trade him. 
and then we'll, then we'll see about Beckham because you're yeah. you're still picking up someone like top threes in the range of outcomes. Why it, we were all so giddy about him in the preseason was well, if he's doing this with Eli, right? What is he going to do with Mayfield now? Of course, Mayfield turns back into a pumpkin, <laughs> and we don't we don't know what we have. Um, and I'm reminded of a report, and I can't remember who it was, Paul, to put out there that said, well, actually, Kitchens wasn't really the 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 main driver of the success at the end of the year. The team success it was more Greg Williams and Dorsey hired Kitchens more so that he would have someone he knew that was smaller than him as a head coach. Yeah, and it would remain his organization. And I'm not saying I'm buying into that. But Kitchens does look small. I mean, Kitchens looks overwhelmed. Yeah, for as sure. A, as a head coach, a lot of the first year head coaches do. And I'm when I'm thinking Jacksonville and uh, Beckham and uh, and Jacksonville and and, and Minshew and, and Mayfield. So here's another thing I'm thinking about, Paul. Like LSU wide receivers. You what about something like you, if you do have Beckham and you could get Chark plus or maybe Chark straight up? I mean, is Chark yeah. what we want Beckham to be? Because Minshew's <laughs> what we want Mayfield to be. <laughs> That's a great point. It's a great point. It, it, Chark is really delivering us the Odell Beckham stat line that we all thought. And we the were play, he had the, yeah. he had the two best catches of the week against Denver. Neither of them even counted. I mean, <laughs> great point. He's making perfect plays on these balls. Like he's doing the like what Tyler Lockett did on that touchdown that everybody saw. Like you know, Jacksonville hasn't been in the national eye, but folks, DJ Chark is making plays that you, you watch enough football, and as a ball is coming in, your brain says that's not going to be caught. Yeah, and he catches it. And that's the though that's the found money that makes the elite guys so much better than the rank and file guys at right. position are the plays that never should never should work and yet they do the Russell Whistle and Tyler Lockett play from uh, from Thursday night uh, was it Thursday night yeah yeah Thursday it night. feels like forever ago yeah, it does, does it? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah and you know you just wow these are the, you know, that's the found money that that you want to get and only a handful of players can do that but that's what we expected with odell beckham that's part of what's made him so special yeah. is those catches that you think nobody else can make but odell finds a way to make and um it, it takes some really bad quarterbacking to bring odell down to earth and, and unfortunately that's that's what we've been now working in odell's favor he's the target share is still pretty darn yeah. good on him um, he withered down to six targets last week, but they just never even had the ball. And they only Baker only threw 22 passes. So to get a six, to get six targets out of 22 passes is actually pretty good. Um, and he's averaging nine-ish uh, targets per game. So the target share is still there. And I just, I just, at the end of the day, we know Odell's a really good player. And I, I just don't, I'm not ready to give up on him. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not either. Um, but I, I, I do think that you know tying all these teams together, I think people are still somehow waiting for more evidence on Chark. And yeah, maybe he's not gonna have a game like he did against Carolina every week. But with Minshew playing, and and it's not just quarterback failing; it's organizational failing of of Beckham right now. Um, and we'll see. I mean, Cleveland, uh, maybe the ship be sinking. Even though, again, because just because they just buried Baltimore. Maybe Baltimore just isn't that good either. Um, yeah, how about Baltimore giving up? Uh, is it? I think I'm on, I want to say 300 passing yards in three straight games. Yeah, I believe uh, that right now they are. They've given up to this point the sixth most passing yards. Sig. Yeah. Um, it was 300, 300. It was three, roughly 350 for three straight games until last week when the the Rudolph Hodges bit came in. Right. And yeah. even then, the Steelers were reasonably effective passing the ball against them. Um, yeah, and, Devlin Hodges went seven for nine for Pete's sake. Right, and he's, um, I yeah, he wasn't even on a run. He was he was thinking XFL at the beginning of the year. Um, and yeah. but, so you bring it up with Baltimore, and then all of a sudden Baltimore now becomes a defense to target. Uh, and and just looking ahead again, um, Cleveland's going to get them again in Week 16 at least. But there is going to be. I wonder how much Jimmy Smith Smith was like a. A linchpin, but I, it, it can't be. And they also have lost uh, their Tony Jefferson, back, and they lost Tony Jefferson. Although Tony mm -hmm. Jefferson was making some really poor plays over the last weeks, but they're going to New England's going to get them. Since uh, Houston's going to get them, the Rams are going to get them uh, coming up. So that's going to be something to watch. The, 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 just watch the AFC North may yet send a, a seven and nine team to the playoffs. Um, well, and we can go, and, and Paul, you know, you always grab the wheel when you want to, but I'm going to grab yeah. the wheel right well, now and say, oh, and say yeah, I, want, right. I want to talk to you team leagues, all right? I want to talk to you Oh, all right. Cause, yeah, cause you, baby. Because you, you've, invited, you've invited me to your league, um, your guillotine league, and it's fun. And I do, and I'm getting in a lot of questions this year 
um, I, you know, at least once a week, I'll get a question about a waiver wire bid amount or a strategy. Yeah. And uh, the key, <laughs> and it's so funny, Paul, because my name is Sigmund, and it's all very Freudian and. Guillotine also has other connotations, but we're talking strictly in fantasy football terms right now. It, these these are interesting times that yeah. we live in. Uh, but the Guillotine League has been so invigorating, Paul, and I and, and for folk for folks that haven't been, yeah, none of this is all you're, you're going to get your like uh, your 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 pitch here. Even though I'm just pitching it from my experience, what's really great about the Guillotine League and folks, if you haven't tried it yet, the idea is it's a survivor league where the when the survivor gets chopped, I mean the, the last place team gets chopped. The players are available on the waiver wire. So every week there's this rush of, you know, this week in ours, Alvin Kamara is available, you know, yeah. and, um, and it, it, and it's only, you only start seven players. You only have 12 players on your roster. Um, so you have hard decisions to make, but here's the thing, Paul, it's, it's the mortality. It's, it's when you set your lineup every week, you're making lineup decisions that are life or death. It's that rush of the fantasy playoffs um, and and also this it turns the screws and I think that it just that because it's a slow burn a fantasy football season but a guillotine league that that there's not a slow burn I mean it's adrenaline every week it it really is you you, you never have a sense of safety sig yeah uh, because the lowest scoring team is always getting chopped you you could ride out one week and you could feel fine and then the very next week you've got a critical buy you've got an injury and you are on pins and needles watching on sunday and hoping that somebody does worse than you you just need yeah. one person to do worse than you and it really is a different mindset to not be last as opposed to striving for first and you you making these critical decisions and then trying to figure out how to manage your your fab and your budget over the course of a whole season when you're saying to yourself my god i've got eric ebron as my tight end and here comes travis kelsey and he's yeah. available what do i do i mean do i push in all my chips you know how do i how am i going to handle this thing and it is, uh, it's invigorated me in for fantasy football as somebody that's been playing for 30 years. It's invigorated me, these guillotine leagues, just in a way that, that I, I haven't been in the past with all the different new formats and wacky stuff that I've tried. This, this is the format that really seems to have some sticking power because I think of the emotional connection, the fear and the anxiety it's that comes fear. with the guillotine league. Well, yeah. it's fear too, because it, it's the only league, you know, you're checking your live scoring uh, you know, halfway through the first set of games and you see yourself down there a couple of notches from the bottom and you look and you only have like two players left and you're looking yeah. at everybody else around you like, oh, well, they have someone who just got hurt. So, uh, but what if I, and it, you know, it's, it's that, that anxiety um, and the idea that every decision you make could haunt you for the rest yes. of the season yes. in any <laughs> given week. Um, and, and, you know, it's what Wyatt is saying. And we've got some good comments in the chat room. He was just kicked out with the 650 left over it oh, look at that. It was still awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, love the guillotine concept from Tab. Thank you, Jim. And, and, and um, you know, it's just, it's just it, it, the layers of strategy and stimulation. Cause I think that's what draws everyone into fantasy football. I know you, you, you put some stuff out there about video games. I know. Do you do board game stuff too? Oh, I'm a big board game. Yeah. yeah and it's all, and, and the commonality here is it's just the puzzle and, and yeah. the stimulation. Um, and especially as, as, you know, as, as fantasy football marches on now into like the, well into the third decade of being a sector industry or something, we all need to keep our brains limber, right? Like we all need to keep doing things with our brain. And in some ways the fantasy football evolution is helping us uh, not, not rest on our laurels. But I, you know, I just, I just think that it's been extremely uh, stimulating and getting back to the, to the core of what draw, drew us into fantasy football to begin with. So I've enjoyed it and may, may we all march on, but you know, we both had a, not a great week, but thankfully somebody yeah, started Sammy Watkins. You know, it's great you know, when that last player left gets a zero because because he gets hurt. It allows some people off the hook here. Um, so it yeah, does. yeah, it brings. I'm telling you, these guillotine leagues. It brings all new um, context. These Sunday night and Monday night games. Yeah. When you are in last place and you got one player going on Monday night. Oh, geez, you know, yeah. pins and needles. Uh, I was, we, uh, we started a guillotine league Reddit, uh, subreddit, uh, mm -hmm. at, uh, guillotine leagues. And, um, and there was a guy who was saying, you know, I, I've got Matt Breida left. No, I'm playing against Matt Breida and I have a 20 point lead. All I got to do is get by Matt Breida. Mm. 
first Oops. quarter is already over. Yeah, it's already over. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. but yeah, it brings that urgency, the the mortality, life or death, into every week of the fantasy football season. Which you know, it's a, it was a, bril- a brilliant concept executed extremely well. And I know people are are, do, are taking and running with it because I'm getting questions about it every week. And uh-huh. and and I think that what's really great, Paul, is that the idea of breaking down the boundaries of how we engage with fantasy football um is there's all who knows what ideas are going to come out there from the hive mind now yes and, and I ways, love that. yeah yes. and technology can support all of it too so that and that's a huge part of it right you know it's one thing to dream up you know i really want to have you know t- the vampire league or whatever but you know if you can't run it online it just the obstacles are too great and that's we do we're starting to see you know, there is some flexibility in these services and different things you can do that do make it possible. By the way, I'll mention, we're still forming guillotine leagues now. You know, we start yeah. with, at Fanball, we start with 17 teams at the beginning of the season so that there's one left at the end of week 16. You know, now we're starting with like 12 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's 12 uh, starting this week. So you can still, you know, if you still want to get in on a guillotine league, you can, fanball.com. And I remember one of the original marketing angles on DFS was, well, if your team is already out of it, um, it still keep you interested, but that's still just for a week. Yeah. And and now you can still make those medium long term investments. You know, you, oh, I wish I would have drafted DJ Chark, and I would have drafted. I would draft him in the second round. Now, well, now yeah, you can. No kidding. Yeah, now you can. Now you can. Uh, now you can rectify those things and see how it all plays out. Um, I've got to go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Well, I, if you, I, and I I can talk eighteen leagues all day, but I really just want I want to spend just a minute on Philip Lindsay. Can we do yeah, that? Sure. So spent all the preseason looking at, is it going to be Lindsay? Is it going to be Freeman? You know, Freeman, you know, bottle reports comes in looking better. And we're, we're looking back and, you know, back, you know, what's the impact going to be of these two? Can we just call this thing over? This is done. Yeah. Philip Lindsay is so damn good. Yeah. And Royce Freeman, you know, he, he is... He's a backup running back. He takes what his offensive line gives you, not a lot more. Philip Lindsay is so dynamic and yeah. explosive, surprisingly strong. He's got the great hands. He the burst, the burst sing. Yeah, yeah. I just my heart fills when I watch him turn these what a three yard gain into a 12 yard gain. Enough of the timeshare. They were separated by two carries last week. Yeah. But Lindsay had double the yards. I want to, I want this to be done. Are you with me on, are you with me on I, this? Do you see I hear it differently? You. I hear you look, and there's going to be, I mean, the one thing I want to say is like, I actually traded away Philip Lindsay in a few dynasty leagues this off season because his wrist injury was pretty serious. And he mm-hmm. is, he is like at that bottom threshold for NFL running back size, which I don't necessarily hold that against him, but I know that coaches might hold that against him, which kind of mm-hmm. gets at what you're talking about. And I, and, you know, Royce Freeman, I mean, Royce Freeman might be in the same galaxy of talent as like Leonard Fournette. I mean, he's not a bad running back. You know yeah. what I mean? He's not a plotter. He's a viable NFL running back. But you're right that when you watch Philip Lindsay, there's just a gap there. And there it's, is. And, and, and the thing that's really exciting to watch about Lindsay is the desire in his game. I mean, oh. it, it, it's reminiscent of Frank Gore, who's still kicking it around there, Marshawn Lynch, and just running with this. The special sauce is he wants it. He mm-hmm. l- runs like his life depends on it, on yes. every touch. And, Will you click on Cecil Lammy on the side yeah, there and yeah. bring him up? Because exactly. what, what Cecil just to is see saying, what happens. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's just see exactly. Well, he isn't that different than McCaffrey in terms of play of of his the strengths stylistically. That, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. It's just that he's a little bit smaller. And 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 Cecil and I were talking about this, and they brought this up during the Broncos Chargers game, Paul. That. Um, Lindsey McCaffrey and Eckler were all seniors in Colorado high school football at the same time. Dang! Wow! Yeah. Jeez! Yeah, and Cecil's son. <laughs> Cecil's son was, I think, on. The, he was telling the story of, of when they when they played. Um, I don't know if he was remember it was a McCaffrey's team or Eckler's team. Anyway, or Lindsey's team. Anyway, it's so it's fun to see the way these things converge. It's fun to see the way these things come, become part of it. But yeah, Lindsey has not only proven that there wasn't a fluke last year, that it wasn't just hitting some big plays on a lower volume. Um, he's proven that he's going to grow. I mean, he's going to develop, even, mm-hmm. become an even better player. And the, the timeshare, I think, in some parts is he did, you know, at the end of the year, I don't know if you can chalk up a wrist injury to overuse, but I do think that they don't want to 
go over that limit. And Royce Freeman is still a solid running back. That being said, Denver's in what's potentially a lost season. Correct. And I feel like, especially with Cecil Lamy in the chat room, like I feel like I shouldn't be saying anything about the Broncos. And I, 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 I should, Cecil, go, I'll send you the link and I can just pull, I should pull Cecil <laughs> in here. Uh, but a, a, anyway, I mean, uh, on another note, um, similarly, like a running back, what I'm thinking about now, but either way, you're going to play Lindsay every week, and most weeks you're going to be happy. And mm-hmm. we'll we'll see if eventually the the obstacles are lifted to him getting that that McCaffrey type workload, or at the very least enough that the the floor games are don't hurt your lineup because of how good he right. is. So uh, James Conner, um, because he was another one that kind of wore down last year at the end of the year, and he was fantastic. And the situation is not nearly as good as it used to be. But now Jalen Samuels is hurt. And uh, the other thing here is now we start looking at, well, hey, they went on the road against San Francisco and, and took it down to the end. Mm-hmm. Now that doesn't look so bad, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, it, you know, that maybe in week one against New England, you know, Roethlisberger was playing with one arm and so on. You know, the Seattle game doesn't look as bad now. Even the game that Roethlisberger went out in, is there a chance that James Conner is still going to deliver maybe not the first round value, but more than people think he's going to deliver. Well, and I was on the wrong side of, well, mostly on the wrong side of Connor is I I had him in the neighborhood of RB 23 or something, because I was Mm -hmm. worried about him wearing down for him staying healthy. I was worried about Jalen Samuels sniping some of his work that the Samuels part never really developed at all. And now he's set for a workhorse load. Now I think the problem is Sig. Who's going to respect the pass in this game? Why would yeah. defenders line up farther than, you know, eight yards off the line of scrimmage? I think he's going to have far more hurdles to deal with now um, than he would have had with Roethlisberger for sure. And I think it's going to remain shockingly inconsistent production for him. And I do worry about, you know, can a guy when it's one thing when you are a running back with Ben Roethlisberger and you've got. You've got defenses that simply have to account for Roethlisberger and Antonio Brown and Juju Smith-Schuster and Vance McDonald, but it's another win. You need to basically be your offense, and mm-hmm. that's the position James Conner finds himself in now, and it's a, it's a different ask than James Conner has had in the past and one that we don't know. He might be up for it, and maybe he's going to, be, maybe he's going to rise to this occasion and be that much better. But we've not seen it yet, and maybe he won't. I'm never. I'm never. I remain. I remain nervous about Connor. It's fair, and it's how much. How much can the offensive line create for him? How much can the offensive coordinator create for yeah. him? Um, and and then you know, there's is the question of, of Juju Smith Schuster uh, also as a player that because always what we're dealing with here, Paul, is what we gauge the perception is versus what we think the reality is and trying to find those gaps. People are going to be down on Juju. Now. I mean, he still scored last week, mm-hmm. but you're feeling that. And again, and, and this isn't just me as an erotic Steelers fan actually trying to be positive, but <laughs> you know, but again, when I look at them barely losing to two NFC West teams when the NFC West is a clearly de- superior division, it makes yeah. me feel not as bad. And you know, the Steelers are going to get into a, a part of their schedule. They played the Chargers this week, uh, but then you know they're going to get into Miami, Indy, the Rams, Cleveland, Cincy, Cleveland, Arizona. Mm-hmm. That doesn't sound bad. Is is Juju a guy you might want to get on the rebound? Maybe Connor can't do it. Is Juju going to show us that he's in that? Beckham kind of category where no matter what's going on around him, he's going to find a way to make plays more often than not. No, I don't think so. Stig. I'm nervous. A couple of yeah. three back to back three catch games. You know, it just, it suggests to me that the, you know, as, as great a receiver as you, you may be ask Stefan yeah. Diggs, you ultimately have to have the quarterback requisite to unlock that production. And I just don't think he's got it. And so I, 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 you know, maybe we're going to be wrong, and Devlin Hodges is going to turn out to be fantastic. But I, I don't think that that's going to be the case here, even capable. And I don't think that's going to be the case. Sig. So, yeah, you know, you know, I think right now you're mostly stuck with them. You can't sell them because you know I, I hate selling great players for pennies on the dollars. To go back to our Odell uh, conversation, right. so you can't sell them. I think you're, you're stuck with them, and you just got to pick your spots to start them now and and start treating them as as basically a flex start at this point. That ha- that you uh, you'll look at every matchup. You'll look at the cornerbacks they'll be facing the safeties, you know, and we'll, we'll figure out who his quarterback is. Hopefully in two weeks, it's Mason Rudolph. I mean, yeah. you know, that, that'd be a lot more promising. Hodges, I mean, in Hodges favor, he did, he racked up 
stats. He was highly prolific as a passer in FCS. Yeah, he was. And uh, the Steelers liked what he did in practice of the players. I mean, he had gotten the respect of the players. He mm-hmm. immediately showed up and, uh, you know, he's going to be limited to, I think, a more intermediate short pass offense. But even when he came in last week, granted, it was Baltimore. But granted, look at the defense they have coming up. So yeah. we'll see. Yeah. We'll all get to see on Sunday night. Speaking of Sunday night, and, and again, Paul, uh, on the couch here, right? So it's all about perception. It's all about psychology. And a lot of what we're doing here is gauging reactions, gauging reactions inside of ourselves, and, ga- and watching the mass reaction, and then seeing where the buy and sell opportunities are. You know, buy when there's blood in the streets and so on. I don't think there's Chiefs blood in the streets right now, but certainly it's funny. Monday night's game was almost like a comic relief punchline <laughs> to to <laughs> is a chaser for a shocking, a frankly shocking. And one in a game that requires a lot more examination. Forget about the fantasy football implications, but we will talk about that. You know, Frank Reich. I think this is this was a game where Frank Reich really put himself on the scene as a, a Belichick type coach. Mm-hmm. I mean, a coach that said, "I don't care what we have, the deck of the hand we've been dealt from the deck of cards. I'm going to go in and try to beat you tonight with what I have and give it everything." And, you know, it's it's game planning, it's preparation. Again, there's a spiritual, emotional element. I mean, this is the Colts team without Andrew Luck. This is a Colts team that, by all typical uh, measures, should have felt like they got the wind knocked out of them yeah. going into the season. And they yeah. went into Kansas City. I think all of us would have said going into last week, the a- AFC is Kansas City or New England, and everyone else is an also ran. Um, but you wonder, so, Paul, I'm sure you see the stats going around, right? Like, eight has like eight touchdowns against zone and one against man. And you, what you do is you just play man against them and so on. That's great. Let's see when Tyreek Hill comes back. Yeah, no kidding. It, but, you know, but is this something where, because regression, regression, regression for the first three weeks, what regression? And then the last two weeks, oh, there's your regression. So there's a lot of angles here. You know, there's buying or selling Mahomes or Hill, or for that matter, even Hardman, Robinson, Pringle, the backfield, Kelsey, uh, it looked like Kansas City was going to be, you know, a, a, a spaceship. <laughs> it was going to propel us in fantasy. And then the last two weeks, all of a sudden, it's like the Wizard of Oz or something when the curtain was pulled back. And whoa, although they did score against Detroit, I mean, they were still prolific offensively, even though there were some moments of struggle. Is this going to be part of a larger downward trend now kansas city has houston yeah but then denver green bay minnesota yeah. Tennessee, and they've got new england ten, den, uh, denver and chicago in the fantasy playoffs so i mean i don't want to i'm not telling scary bedtime stories or anything like that <laughs> but you, if this is if it, it, did we start to see something change in the destiny of new england i'm sorry of kansas city or is, is this just another thing for Patrick Mahomes to overcome and you know, show his superhero colors again. I think there's a tangible reason for concern, despite the fact that Patrick Mahomes is a generational arm talent. You can look at an inconsistent offensive line. You can look at a backfield that misses Kareem Hunt. Um, even if you add Tyreek Hill back in, which is no small loss, um, I still don't know that it automatically turns into the Chiefs version of last year. It doesn't have it doesn't have that feel to it. Certainly, do, it certainly doesn't right now. And one of the key things that we're going to have to continue to monitor so much of what Patrick Mahomes does that makes him extraordinarily special, say, is his ability to throw on a dead run and throw it forty yards downfield and right on the money. That's been missing for two straight weeks. That Lions game and then the game uh, last week were dramatically different. He was misfiring all over the field, and uh, we're not used to seeing that. The ankle injury is really significant. And if you take the wheels off of him and he's not able to run and isn't able to plant and throw from the run, I think that's a material change to this offense. Um, Now, all that said, he could still be one of the three best fantasy quarterbacks as he is still right now um, by fantasy points scored. But I think that um, I think there's reason. I think there's reason to for concern and reason to think that it's just not going to be what it was last year. Um, can I go over to the Frank Reich part of this conversation? Yeah, please. That you started with just for oh a moment? yeah. 
I want to I want to take two I want to take two two teams that I think um, that that were that both had sort of an interesting situation last week. So here's Frank Reich, and he's looking at a Chiefs defense that's really struggling against the run, and they've improved their secondary a lot. You know, they were the worst, maybe the worst secondary in football last year. They're middle of the pack this year, but they really struggled against the run. So you got Frank Reich over here. Where mm -hmm. let's get Frank Reich over here. Ha! I can't uh, here Frank Reich. Then. I've got the Dallas Cowboys facing uh -huh. almost the exact same situation. They've got a Packers team that is bad against the run and, and been very good against the pass. What do they end up doing? They end up only running Ezekiel Elliott 12 times in the entire game. Frank Reich ran Marlon Mack 29 times. And he stayed true to the vision of what his defense, what the defense was going to give him. And the and Dallas didn't, and Kellen Moore didn't. And they 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 put themselves in a position where they had to throw into the teeth of the best, the best thing that the that the Packers defense can can bring to the field. And it allowed the Packers to, to play right into their strengths. And I think we saw we saw two outcomes that reflect two different levels of coaching and two different mindsets. And I think this is part of what shows that Frank Reich is, you know, you called him on a Belichick level. I'm not ready to go quite that far, but I think, I think he has a far better understanding of how to attack his opponents. And when I invoke Belichick, Paul, what I'm really trying to say is somebody who honestly takes on the, the task of this week, we're going to create a game plan to beat this team and that yeah. means and that means that means the range of the forms that we can take may even be reinvented that week if we find that let's try this mm -hmm. let's take on mm -hmm. again i always come i'm uh, this is probably the 17th time i mentioned this that they won the super bowl against the rams in a personnel set package they had i think they even mm -hmm. had only Never practiced <laughs> right. yeah like 10 <laughs> times the entire yeah. season they trusted the players and of course you know, this gets into parenting and things like that, like trust or coaching. Um, trust comes out of th that drilling and that really harsh, mm -hmm. hard system. Then you trust. Then that creates the freedom to trust. Or uh, the Matt Waldman example about you know musician who plays for thousands of hours, and then when they improvise, it's sublime. Uh, mm -hmm. Because but it's that that lays the groundwork. Um, so it's just been. And what's wild about this, and what's and why. The NFL forces you to keep your mind limber. Is just the last past week, Oakland pretty thoroughly beat Indy. Yeah, in Indy, and, and then Oakland beat Chicago. Oakland and Chicago come out of that game with the same record. What I want to take out of Oakland, and it, well, two things to take out of. I guess one is that we should stop laughing at John Gruden. Yeah, I know he's a coach of the year candidate right now. Well, he's getting he's getting everybody to pull in the same direction. He's getting mm -hmm. everybody emotionally, psychologically invested, um, but. I want to call some attention because, and I think this might be a, a, a buy high moment in fantasy, especially because the buy is going to be a lull for Josh Jacobs. Wow. Um, yeah. and, what, and a, there was, what a great game he had. Well, and, and even the game before uh, he, he didn't put up a lot of stats, but you saw that some of the qualities of him as a running back, because I think that people were really shocked that a running back that, Nick Saban didn't even consider one of his two best backs. If you look at workload could go in the first round. Now I was fully on board the first round train in part because of his passing game prowess. And there was a, a play two weeks ago against Indy where he picked up the blitz. Then he presented himself as a check down, got Derek Carr's attention, caught the ball and then made someone miss in the open field. And they even, you know, had the wherewithal to change, just did everything perfectly uh, and, and did it all on one play. And then you saw last week, an incredible sp a spin move, a jumping spin move. And this yeah. Like five, 10 to 20. He's not supposed to be able to do stuff like that, but most importantly, he's closing the circuit. Now we finally saw last week where uh, Gruden wants to Cadillac him. I mean, Gruden, Gruden's like, we were going to win with you. We're going to win yeah. behind you. Yeah. And he wasn't a lead back at Alabama but he can be a lead back against the Chicago Bears and win and, and put the team on his back offensively, then that's pretty exciting because this is a three and two team and this is a competitive team. And again, you look at their schedule, but Green Bay, okay. I mean, it's Green Bay is an interesting team for sure. Houston, Detroit, the, the Chargers, Cincinnati, Cincinnati, the Jets, Kansas mm -hmm. City, um, you know, they, they were outclassed by Kansas City first time around. Tennessee, Jacksonville, the Chargers again. I mean, these are all games that 
Jacobs is going to get as much work as he can handle, and now it seems like it's clicking. But I feel like the Oakland story in general continues to be under the radar, and that's something you can take advantage of when you buy Jacobs. Agreed. Can I give you a parallel rookie yeah. that I think is on a similar trajectory? Mm -hmm. Kyler Murray. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I think there, I really think it's all coming together with Kyler Murray. And I, I went through and watched all of his passes in this last game. The first series, um, he was the, the, the adrenaline was flowing. It was a little amp up, amped up. And he, he overthrew a couple of, a couple of receivers in the first series, settled down after that SIG. And he played a great game, a really good game. He had a level of poise and accuracy on his throws that were was terrific. He has this effortless delivery that he's kind of had all year, but it, it, it all was it was all clicking. Now, didn't score any touchdowns. I yeah. really think he's I really think he's below the radar. People don't realize because the touchdowns are masking what has right. been a, a, a really nice development for him. And here comes the Falcons. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> What an opportunity for Kyler Murray this week where, you know, this could be the week when we finally get both the running and the receiving to jive together and the monster week could be coming that we've been talking about. And they are finally giving him the design runs as well. Sig. yeah, you know, and that's been something that they, that Cliff King Kingsbury was reticent to do early on, but not now he's getting these plays that are built to take advantage of what he can do on the ground, which is great. And by the way, Falcons have given up two rushing touchdowns to quarterbacks already this year. Yeah. It's it, it could all come together this week for Kyler Murray. Yeah, in this discussion, I'm just going to bring it up as I'll bring it up as a, a data point to talk about too. Eric Whitehart asked, "Would you try to trade Rodgers for?" Oh Murray? God, that, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, please. And, if you can do it, do it. And the Rodgers thing really quickly, and then we'll get back to Murray. Aaron Rodgers still looks like Aaron Rodgers to me. Mm -hmm. um, now you didn't have Devontae Adams. But he, the defense is too good. The defense is is taking because we saw the one game when the Eagles used Jordan Howard, and that's not going away. By the way, I mean the coaches were even the Philly coaches have been wonderfully transparent. You know when they said Miles Sanders is in it, getting it done, leaving yards on the field, they just told us that. So you yeah. kind of see Howard coming, and mm -hmm. they're saying, "Yeah, Howard's earned this." But they ran at Green Bay. It's gonna be interesting to see Carry on Johnson get his chance. To run at Green Bay mm -hmm. again under the radar. C.J. Anderson getting released means Carryon Johnson's getting unleashed. Yeah, uh, and uh, he, it's coming, folks. It uh, is coming. Detroit's a good team. Detroit's a legit yeah. good team, and uh, that's going to be fun to watch Monday night. Carryon Johnson's going to get his chance. And Matt Patricia says, "I don't need an invitation to run the ball. Uh, and we're going to run the ball and not going to attack." the Green Bay pass defense the, the same way that Dallas made Correct. that mistake. Correct. Uh, so with Rodgers, it's just as long as this defense continues to play this way, he's not going to get the game scripts. Uh, and we'll see about Devontae Adams, because I think even when Devontae Adams comes back, I'm not sure if he'll be Devontae Adams or how long he'll be Devontae Adams because of toe injuries. Go ahead. Well, yeah. I mean, if we go back, if we go back to week 10 of last year, Aaron Rodgers is averaging one touchdown pass per game. Yeah. One. And he had Devontae Adams for all but one of those games. So, you know, Devontae Adams does not automatically change the outlook for Aaron Rodgers. And some of it is, what, eight rushing touchdowns now for Aaron Jones in five yes. games? But if it ain't and, broke, don't fix it. And by the way, I, yeah. I assume that you are with so many of the fantasy owners out there that have had Aaron Jones, and we've been asking ourselves, let him be a workhorse for yeah. the love of God. Stop with the 50, 50 timeshare with the, the plotting straightforward Jamal Williams. And we finally got it. Sig. And yeah. it, I don't care what the because circumstances Jamal Williams got hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's because he went down and I, yeah. I don't wish injury on anybody. Cause that's horrible juju, but nevertheless, I want to believe that Matt LaFleur is now seeing what a workhorse looks like, you know, look, go back to this game tape and see how Aaron Jones just continued to be strong through that whole game. And when Williams comes back, I hope it does. I hope there's not this necessity to go back right. to the timeshare. Well, and it, Williams is still a useful back. And I, I do think they may use Williams more to pace. They don't have a buy until week 11. So mm -hmm. Williams can come back in the next week or two. But th the important thing for fantasy is the die has already been cast that it's Aaron Jones at the goal line, and Aaron Jones has encouraged them to continue to go Aaron Jones at the goal yes. line. And I was also giving a moment to say uh, El Paso Strong and UTEP, and uh, mm -hmm. El, not just a UTEP player, but an El Paso player, my wonderful wife, Kate, from El Paso. And I spent Aww. some time in El Paso as a kid, as a three-year-old. I spent six months living in El Paso. Had a, a velvet Bugs Bunny painting to show for it. I have no idea where it is now. Uh, <laughs> 
and uh, you love it. El Paso High School, El Paso uh, product. And the, the lowest gonna... rated movie in the history of cinema, according mm -hmm. to the IMDb, is a movie called Manos, The Hands of Fate. Huh. It was a mystery science theater did it and Rift Tracks did a version yeah. of it. And that was filmed on location in El Paso, yeah. Texas in the 1960s. I love it. I, I, you know, this is like, we should do the pop-up video version of On the Couch, where every time we talk about something, we just take a, a 90 degree right angle <laughs> off. Right. And, and eventually everything becomes about the interstitial nature of reality, that everything is related <laughs> to everything. And we can end up anywhere. I mean, that's I, one of my original visions for the couch. And Paul, you've been one of the best at, at realizing it is, you know, we start a fantasy football but we can end up anywhere. And now we're in the last 10 yeah. minutes. In the last 10 minutes, we really can end up anywhere. And I want to so go there. Go ahead. We're in the ha we're in the hashtag pineapple zone. Yeah, as, pineapple. Uh, as some people have reminded well, us. Well, I want to I want to go there because it's and I I mean there's a there's some, a lot of interesting things going on, but there's this idea like stick to sports. Um, but we have this yeah. we have the ultimate breaking down the boundary between stick to sports and this NF NBA China thing. Yeah. And I wonder if this is going to bleed over into into the NFL in some way, shape, or form in some way. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious what could because and what's interesting here is I can't remember who it was now on Twitter that pointed out that David Stern in an interview like 13 years ago brought up that yeah, this China thing could eventually be problematic. Um really? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was aware of like how he has to serve the business interests of the mm -hmm. league, but at the same time it could eventually create a problem because of the the difference in the nature of the values of this of the two societies um you know um but i think also what this is peeling back not to make this too big beyond sports story is that the nba is by far not the only american business entity that is in this kind of position now no. where where yeah. getting china's money is a se absolutely essential to to their business model it's intoxicating now. yes but what it means is now like there can be tiny censorship on American soil. I don't know. I don't want to. I mean, if I anytime I'm going to start giving my views on something, Paul, people are going to realize like how how radical I am, or how how far outside of the Overton window I am. But I'm just curious what your reaction is because this is like yeah. a develop a big developing story. It is, and, and it's an attention story. It's making people think about something that maybe they don't want to think about, and that always fascinates me. I want to. I, I will start here, Sig. I believe that human beings come out come out of the womb with a certain number of rights. And, you know, we've got the Bill of Rights. Yeah. And there's a reason that the first right is, and correctly so, is the freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. Now, there are like fringy freedom of expression things like we don't yell fire in a in a, right. in a, in a theater. Right. I mean, but that's but that doesn't matter. Right. At, the, at its core, human beings who we are, we we get to by just the inalienable right that we have of existence to say what's on our mind and to be free to dissent with the person next to us, for you and I to disagree and for me and Donald Trump to disagree or for me and Nancy, Nancy Pelosi to disagree, we get to do that. And the fact that there are, there are a tiny group of dictators in China and they, it is a dictatorship that control the reins of billions of people and are now exerting their will on an inalienable right that all human beings have, whether it be in Hong Kong or, as it turns out, an NBA player or an NBA owner to me is deeply, deeply troubling. And I never like to see the consolidation of power. Sig, mm -hmm. you, I want, I want you, Sigmund Bloom, to have as much yeah. power as you sure. can harness, and you know, and be you. And I want to have as much as I can have. And I want James Newbury in our chat yeah. room to have power. And I don't want, I don't, I never like whether it's a, a corporate entity, a political machine, a military. I don't want to see people get squashed. And that's what they're doing in China for their the purpose of maintaining the status quo, which has made you know, billionaires out of these politicians at the top of this dictatorship. And it's, I find it very troubling. It is troubling, but it, this all, this, the wheel keeps turning, you know, Paul, I, I've been saying this a lot lately and I'll say it now too. Cause I mean, really in my heart of hearts, I want to start the revolution. Like really in my heart of hearts, I have, I have closely held values, strongly held values that I, when I was, like, if you were talking to me when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, it was the only thing on my mind. And then I went to law school and I got to peek behind the curtain and I saw that the game was rigged and it kind of took my oomph away from mm. get, pulling a chair up to the table and playing the game. Uh, but I do want to say this because as I've, as I've grown older, I realize that while I was younger, 
I was more obsessed with winning or losing or not, you know, of de defeating or thwarting or stopping or reversing or changing. And these things are all important. But the older I get, the more I see, Paul, that really that tension, you can cast it however you want it. Tent, you know, light and dark, or our, our higher or lower instincts, or the spirit mm -hmm. or the spirit in the flesh. Or, you know, there's a lot of ways that this tension has been cast. That tension is the spark that turns the engine of 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 civilization, of of human activity. And the the real game here is not whether one side triumphs over the other, because it'll never happen. The wheel will keep turning, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a you can feel it, and there definitely is such a thing as mass consciousness. I mean, you can look back at the late '60s. You can look at like the um, Arab summer. Like there is mm -hmm. definitely something where things ripple through the mass consciousness, and we all are connected. The internet is real. It was just um, we added all of this to manifest it, but we've always been all connected in a way that we don't necessarily understand, but we experience. There's a lot of pivotal things happening in the world right now, and the wheel, and it'll flip over, and it'll be out of balance again, and then it'll kind of get back into a balance, and then it'll flip over again. And the real game is not who wins or loses or where that pendulum stops, because it will never stop. It's a play. All the world's a stage, right, Shakespeare? And you decide what your role in the play is, and you deliver your lines, and deliver your lines with feeling, and you get to decide when the credits roll who you were in that story. That's the actual thing. That's what this is all about. I want to make sure Sigmund Bloom has lines and can <laughs> say his lines. Well, thank and you. there's there's nobody to stop Sigmund Bloom from the freedom of expression and, and saying your lines. And that's yeah, you know, that's that to me is just it can't be extinguished though, Paul. It can't be extinguished well, because no, we were facing we as human beings faced much longer odds mm -hmm. than we face now from China or from any other force out there that wants to try to stop free thought and free expression. It's indestructible. And the more they try to, they, they, they thought they buried me, but I was a seed and I grew up again. Yeah, I, 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 I want that to be the case. But then you look at Hong Kong and, you know, you've, you know and I, I feel like these people are going through so much and they, they get so yeah. little support. And, you know, they, you know, they have no voice and now they can't even wear, they, you know, they can't wear masks so that, you know, the, the Chinese government can ID them all and they can right. all be electronified and their privacy can be ruined. And. I find it very, you know, that part is all, it's all very troubling. What, would, very stop, troubling. what would happen, say, let's say, okay, so the NBA, I've heard reports today, the NBA gets five, $4 billion out of their deals with China. Right. Um, they have 22 NBA stores. They, um, the ratings for the NBA games are through the roof in oh, China. Yeah. What would happen if the NBA walked away? What if, what if Adam Silver actually I, said, you know, I, let to us hell pray. with the money, to hell yeah. with the money. We are going to take a stand for humanity. Yes. And for once, it's not, you know, our our, our billionaire owners are going to be fine. They're going to yes. be okay. You know, we're, we'll are we make do without the four yeah. billion. They'll and be okay. We'll, you know, yes. Well, they'll we be okay. Stand for something. Paul, if he, I mean, Adam Silver, speaking of being part of the, the high mind, like I want to send a message. This is what prayer and things are about, right? I mean, he could start the scales tipping back in the other direction yes. and remind okay. everybody. Because I think in this late stage capitalism world, like we're all weary, we're all fatigued. Even people that are doing well, I think, are fatigued because we're so absorbed in the game. And there's a larger game that penetrates through things that awaken our soul and 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 inspire us. But that's the 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 exception, not the rule in our lives on a day to day basis. I think people are really weary, and something like this, where the NBA said. There is something that's more important than money. There is something that's more valuable than money. Yeah. It's our values. It's what we stand for. It's what our life stands for. Again, the lines you said, you know, like what role did you play? What does your name mean when people think of it in the world? And the NBA can actually, by saying, because the, because China's pushing back. I mean, China's saying, well, now we're going to reevaluate all of our relationship after this. We find safe. I mean, isn't that like the most American America, you know, to yeah. say, we, that wasn't isn't that when people think of America being great? I mean, that's American greatness is standing for these values. Like you say free expression, as you said so eloquently. So it's fascinating because I think that people can say, keep your a sports or a diversion, keep your politics and things out of my sports. But everything is life. Everything is, I mean, it's everything. And uh, I just find it so fascinating how like this is this is gripping. I don't think we've ever I can't remember anything remotely like this happening in no, professional I'm sports. 
Agreed. And, you know, Adam Silver uh, once has completely reoriented a conversation, sports betting. You know, mm-hmm. on, on, he became the first person to change the trajectory of, of sports betting. This is a, a far bigger global human rights issue that he could, he won't, he's going to bend the knee. I'm, I'm positive. Uh, yeah. But, you know, he if if he were to take a stand and say, you know what, China, you know, we'll be there when you're ready. And but it's not now. And, you know, when Hong Kong has democracy and they've got a voice and you don't have jackbooted thugs that are, you know, the, that are corralling and jailing people, you know, we're interested in doing business. It would his legacy would forever change. And in my mind, for the better. Yeah, and maybe there'll be this opportunity. Maybe if not this opportunity, maybe another opportunity. One person can make a difference in this case with Adam Silver. But yeah, I believe one person can make a difference, even if they aren't the commissioner of the NBA. And as you say, he may have been. And I'm sorry, I'm going. Uh, uh, we're going to do a little tiny overtime because now I'm, I'm. I keep all this stuff under wraps, Paul. But it's there. It's there. People should see me stalking around, around my my place here in New Orleans sometimes when things get me worked up. One person happens. Not only. Paul, not only can one person make a difference, I feel certain that if we look back at every difference, it all started with one person. Every single one of them did. Every single one of them started out with one person saying no more. Mm. One person saying, I'm saying no. I'm saying that I don't have a price, right? I mean, in some ways, I think that's why the Jesus story really resonates. Because in the story, Jesus Christ was somebody who didn't have a price. Yeah. Who didn't have like a button you could press and own him. And that, and they had to, they had to, 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 you have to deal with, you have to deal with Jesus. And Jesus, you have to deal with him on a, on a moral or foundational level, right? Right. And what did we do? And, 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 what, and what did human beings do when presented with that kind of figure? They they, they killed they, him. They killed him. They you yeah. know, um, and 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 that's so. It's a story about us, but it's also a story about our nature. And every one of these great changes, where we have re- released the grip of concentrated power over how we live our lives, all started with one person. All started with one person, and that's what leadership is. It's just knowing what to do because it's coming from a place of value, a place of your soul, and not because someone told you, or not because of what you have to gain or lose, but because you because of righteousness. And uh, it's that time, I think, that people cr- are craving people standing up and saying something that we all feel every day, but we're too tired to do something about it. And now we've come full circle. So yeah. if it all starts with one person, the freedom of exp- we're back to the freedom of expression. Yep. That person has to be a, you, you can't you can't put you have to be able to give people a voice and a, and a, that one person needs to be able to reach a second person and they tell two friends and they tell two friends and that's how these things grow. And if if it all starts with one person, we can't be silencing that one person. And you yeah. you have to be willing to let people dissent and have have a voice and. It's just, and again, you know, we're back to where we were. We've, we've, I think we've, we've come, we've come full circle, and uh, you know, I, I hope that you know our game, the NFL, for whatever, for whatever it, it faults it has, and it has many. Like everything is complicated and is interwoven into society as the NFL is. Um, it hasn't had to deal with this mm-hmm. for all the things it has had to deal with. Um, but we, you know, then again. You know, some players would say they've been silenced, well, right? That, right? You know, so sure. you know, would Colin Ka- Kaepernick say he's been silenced? He probably right. would. Yeah. Well, and and I think maybe what we're going to continue to see is more of these things put under the microscope, where we look a little bit, a little bit closer of how different things are connected in yeah. our world, and aligning ourselves with the things, uh, helping the things flourish that are more aligned with our values. Uh, but Paul, it's always it, it was we were going to get here one of the pineapple section, <laughs> the these pineapple days. section, and, yeah. and, and, and we'll see where it takes us because I think that one of the things that's come through from the very first time that you are on the couch or any time that we've worked together or encountered each other is there's fantasy football and there's all these things that bring us all together but really as I, I hit over and over and over again what this is really about is human connections and uh and we can our handshake can be talking about football and we can be stimulated by each other by how we experience football uh but then there's a larger thing going on and i think that's what's driven the fantasy football world that's what's driven the podcast uh, the, the sports media, you know, people complain now so many people are covering football and things like that. But I think it's just, again, that craving of a community mm-hmm. of, a pl- of a place where we feel connected and we feel like we belong. And uh, Paul's never been a, a problem 
whenever you and I get together, having our show resonate with that. And I appreciate that. And I always look forward to our chances to get together. And it also, you know, your ideas and what you're doing. That's why it's easy for me to say guillotine leagues. We'll, we'll spice up your fantasy life again. Cause I know some people they can get speaking of being weary. Um, so it's always enjoyable. And now we only did a half hour of the preseason. I think we more than made up for it. Yeah. In this one, yeah. And I know it won't be the last time we talk this season. And so you are the best, Sig. I, I love that we can have these kind of diversions, have thoughtful discussions. And, um, you know, this is I, fantasy football is a microcosm of so many ways and so many other things that we do. And we're part of a, you know, we're part of, we're one of 12 people in our fantasy league, but we're of a much broader fantasy community. And even beyond that, just as, you know, human beings who care about shared values and you know, the things that are important to us. And I love that we can divert our attention away from, a you know a PPR scoring opportunity against the number twelve defense from time to time, and <laughs> yeah. you know get into the things that that matter to us on a core level that's you know deep in our nature, and that's uh, that's that's what makes the couch so special. It, well, and it, it's always just a journey through uh, our, our minds, and um, and re yeah, remember, folks, really one encounter every time you encounter another human being, it can change someone's life, it can change your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and that's part of what we're about here. And we're also just about enjoying each other's company. And I, I think that is never something we fail to do here on the couch. We do it in your spirit, everybody out there in the fantasy football world. So thank you for coming, being part of the chat room. Thank you for being part of our community. Thank you for giving us your support and allowing us to do this. And I hope we give something back to you all the time. You deserve it because you're so very classy.